Serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer have a crazy cult following. Join me for an interview with one of Milwaukee's bar owners who knew Dahmer. You're going to be amazed at how this killer continues to victimize people and inspire people decades after he was arrested for killing more than 17 people. Well, welcome to Profiling Evil in this interview with Bob Weiss, the proprietor of Shaker's Cigar Bar in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I just spent a week with the International Chiefs of Police in Milwaukee, and at night, I walked Dahmer's hunting grounds. I went to the place where he was arrested and the place where those bodies were recovered. And I also went to many of his haunts, including Bob Weiss's bar, the the Shaker's Cigar Bar. Now, Bob remembers Dahmer, and he'll never forget the creepy feeling that he had any time he served that predator his preferential drink, a gin and tonic. You should have seen the way he described him sipping that gin and tonic through a straw as he sat in the bar on a peculiar chair. You're going to learn more, but please take a moment, hit the like and subscribe button, and ring the bell so that you get all of our videos. Now, in this interview, you're going to see that the video is not that great. Frankly, it was taken with my iPad and my laptop inside the dark confines of Shaker's Cigar Bar. Now, this is an iconic bar that has been around a long time. Actually, the building was owned by the Capone Brothers before Bob bought it. The audio for Bob Weiss is really good. I I only had one microphone with me. So my audio, it's a little bit wonky but I relied on my iPad and it's the best I could do. So please cut me a little slack and I hope you enjoy this interview. Folks, I'm, I'm here with Bob Weiss, old, owner of Shaker Cigar Bar in Milwaukee. And if, and for any of you, if you come here, you're going to have a blast. Not only is the decor amazing, I'm learning today that there are some pieces of furniture that actually tie to the Jeffrey Dahmer case and I'm going to find out what the reason is for that. But most importantly, if you're lucky enough to, to meet the proprietor, Bob Weiss. Mike, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you came to Milwaukee. It's such a beautiful day. It's got to be, what, 50 degrees or something and rainy and fog at the same time. So kind of like an Oregon thing. Of course, they commit suicide there, don't they? Anyway, um, here we are in Milwaukee, and we're going to talk about the Cream City cannibal, Jeffrey Dahmer. So um, your question was, um, how do I tie into this nonsense, right? Of the many things that um, you could probably justifiably note me for in my life, uh, the one thing that I would not want to be noted for was any association or affiliation with Jeffrey Dahmer. So we opened up in 1986, and pretty much from day one, our clientele was mostly from Chicago and other places. And at that time, we were open for lunch, and our lunch business was pretty much... Uh, DOJ, judges, district attorney's office, major law firms, um, some uh, design firms, but all it's all corporate America. And a busy little thing, kind of a vibe like uh, the Fog City Diner in San Francisco, uh, very interactive, and everybody who works at Shakers, with very little exception, in the last 36 years has been female. So you've got 37 or 8 people on staff, and except for myself, uh, a dish dog, and one of the line cooks, and one bartender, token bartender who's male, everybody else is female. So you'll see that as you absorb the night, the scenery, and everything else here. Um, So we we always say that we're not better than Milwaukee, but we're definitely different than Milwaukee. So those things that people uh, talk about, the, uh, you know, the, the fine dramatic sausages, the cheese curds, things like that, the great, you know, push for beer, that's just not us. But uh, we're glad you enjoy it. Oh, it's fantastic. Now, were you raised here in Milwaukee? I was born in Milwaukee, yes, and uh, then grew up in the Burbs and went to school here as well. Um, and then left. And I was gone for a long period of time, did a variety of things. Um, yet this was always part and parcel uh, of my background, food and beverage. Now, now uh, your folks, blue-collar workers, professional. I mean, we got Marquette University close by, other... Uh, universities. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the yeah, yeah, nature my, and flavor of the town and your family. Uh, well, it's 
those completely different things, I suppose. And yet not, because my, my father's side was uh, German. Uh, my mom's side was Greek. Uh, she was a tax examiner for uh, a revenue agent, actually, for the IRS. And uh, he was an engineer for Cutler Hammer, which uh, then became Eaton Corporation. So uh, really cool because back in the 60s, uh, he'd bring home things that they're working on for the space program. And uh, that was uh, Mercury and Gemini and whatever else. And his name is signed on a few pieces on the moon that they took up for part of the Apollo project. So um, that was... That was our background. So education was pushed, obviously. I mean, reading since I was three. Um, I have an older sister who, um, amongst other things, is a, a very prominent attorney. Uh, but she also has a, a PhD and an MBA, and she's just, you know, in that. So she ran the Immunology and Hematology Lab at Children's. So that background has always been part and parcel, where science has been an important part of at least my upbringing. So, um, 1986, my ex-wife, uh, now ex-wife, uh, we are living away, decides it's time to settle down and have a family. We're both from the area, um, and uh, we come back here, and I'm working with the city of Milwaukee with the uh, Department of City Development, and they want me to open up somewhere else, on the east side or else downtown. But as I get off the expressway, I'm coming from Chicago, I would pass this place. This is the old warehouse district. And um, at the time, I, I've always had multiple businesses. I had some a firm called Design Tech Manufacturing, where we work with, with wood, real wood. So uh, aside from the, the old oaks, it was teaks, and it was bobingas, and tiger wood, and purple heart, and you know, exotic woods, right? So I uh, had a partner in that who's a master carpenter, Kevin McHale, and I divested my interest in that company for him to work with me on this. The building was for sale. I said, I've got to have this building. I like old things. And I like wood, and there's plenty of wood here. So um, acquired this in 1986. Now a little backstory on the building, I suppose, at this point. The building itself was built in 1894, the year that martinis were created in the country. Uh, birth uh, year of Dasho Hammett, one of the greatest mystery writers of all time in San Francisco. But um, 1894 was an interesting time because we're not far removed from the Civil War. And this area that takes place here underneath this building and this little area is the part of the three original cemeteries of the state of Wisconsin for European settlers. The Native Americans were still not that far away from the Civil War, had their um, Indian burial grounds just west of us along the canal, so half a block that away. So here from what's now 2nd Street and to the marshes, Milwaukee meeting places, smelly waters, marshes, was a cemetery. So in 1835, this little girl named Elizabeth, who's climbing for apples, this little stand of apple trees in the cemetery, she falls, she breaks her neck. Way before Harry Potter, we've had a little girl in the bathroom, which is right behind you. The ladies' restroom is right there. And myriad stories from the first day that I opened up where women would say, who's that little girl? They'd see her shoes, knock on the door, lock the stall door, unlock the stall door, turn on the water, turn off the lights, you know, whatever she would do, giggle, short old sing. And we'd say something like, have another martini because there's no little girl here, you know, because this is all corporate America, right? So this ties together because um, in 1991, January, there's this guy that starts walking in the place. And he looks nothing like our customers. He certainly is not an attorney. He's not with the, with the government. We've had a huge thing with the FBI pretty much since day one here. And he's none of that. He just sticks out like a sore thumb. They're very non-communicative. And of course, we've got lovely uh, bartenders and servers here, but he wants nothing to do with them. He's insistent that they get a man to come out of the kitchen, myself or my sous chef. I'm, I'm a chef as well. And we would have to make him a silly gin and tonic, right? And there's no great contact. He's not, I'm Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm a serial killer. You'll read about me one day. None of that. But he had these eyes that were like, I say like gimlets. They would just bore into you. And I will never forget this until I die. It's like, the, the shark in Jaws or um, the dinosaur in Jurassic Park when you first see it, it's got that dead but really menacing eye that is just glaring into you. That's Jeffrey Dahmer. So all he wanted was a gin and tonic. Sure, I can spare the few minutes to make your gin and tonic, put it on the bar, done with that. Now, the furniture ties in with this very stool that your camera is sitting on because the entire front bar and back bar had the same style of stool at that time. 
But you notice on this one, Mike, that there is a little spacer right here. So this is maybe whatever the size is, you know, this is an inch higher than all the other stools. So you've got 24 stools in the house. For whatever reason, this was shipped to us with that spacer in it, okay? So this is at the front bar, and he would find that stool, and he would sit in that stool and just watch everything around him. You know, sip out of a straw, his little, you know, gin and tonic, and just watch the world go by. So my thought on that is that he wanted to be above people because, you know, obviously sociopath, psychopath, egomaniac, narcissist, all the above, he wanted to be special so he'd be just that little bit above other people. And then my theory is that the reason that, 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 is, re that, that is really insightful. And, and how long did it, before the light turned on that that was the reason the stool was so important? Um, probably after we realized who he was after he was caught. And I go, well, I'm working on that story as well. So we got this guy who's on this stool who started in January of 91. And it might have been a couple of weeks before he saw him again. And then he would be here progressively more until he was hooked up in the summer of 91. right? And uh, the 24th of June, I believe. So uh, there was a flurry of activity taking place. You'd see more of him coming in. Again, he would never fit into any part of anything. We had live jazz played here as well for lunch every day. So clearly he was not remotely part of that scene, right? And uh, just, you know, one or two. And then out he goes, you know, and it didn't matter what the conditions were. He always looked pretty much the same to us. And um, you probably wouldn't pay much attention to him except for the fact that he was so odd. And uh, you having been a cop for years, you, you got that sensation anyway. You know, when someone means you harm or there's something on toward or women walking on the street know if they should be more aware of something else. You got that cop sense. You've got that extra sense. And, um, well, we, at least I, certainly got that with, with this character as well. So um, the night that he gets snagged, and of course, we're, we're a cop bar. We're a federal agent bar. So there's a flurry of activity. Cops are coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. And uh, we don't have the real story. I mean, bits or pieces are coming out. They found body parts, whatever. It's like, well, we're busy anyway. Whatever's going on doesn't pertain to us, right? So the next morning, um, 7 o'clock or so, because we'd open at noon, Right. And um, I suppose if we're ambitious, then uh, those of us in the kitchen are here at, at 1030 or something prepping for the day. Um, I get a phone call at home at 7-ish in the morning saying, uh, it's, a, it's a federal agent that I've known for years. Um, would you mind opening early for us? I don't mind. And I'm thinking 10 o'clock. I, I can be there or something. And uh, I, I said, uh, when do you have in mind? He said, how about now? Okay. So I live on the west side. So it took me 15 minutes to throw some clothes on and drive down here. And uh, I get here, and I'm, I'm clearly blurry-eyed. I'm standing behind the bar, and there's maybe a dozen people. There's uh, there's someone from the, from the bureaus here. The DOJ is here. The DA's office has one or two people here. Uh, there's a couple of cops that are here, detectives. And they've got two people from the local media, but only two people. And the concept was that they wanted to um, release the story to the local media before the, the national media and whoever else as part of the circus that would come to town. So I'm behind the bar and I'm working my way through coffee and they're, they've got their, uh, what do you call the sheets when you, you take pictures of someone? The rap sheets. The rap sheets, yeah. okay. So they're passing those along to people and I'm behind the bar and I'm like, well, time out. I recognize this guy and this is my story. Those eyes, I will never forget. And that was Jeffrey Dahmer. That's the first time we had the association that the guy that they had just apprehended as being a you know murderer and a cannibal, whatever else he was at that time, was the guy that would come in here and have his gin and tonics. So, you know, gin makes you sin, I suppose. But um, that's, that's how that began. And then... Now, many of these were the same cops that were coming here after work or and and they never i guess saw him put two and two together this is the same kid that's coming into work. there there might have been some recognition at some point that this is a guy that they had picked up for something else for um indecent exposure or something else but um it, it was never 
enough of anything. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, no, that's that guy or something or whatever else. It, it wasn't. They weren't. He wasn't wanted for anything, so nobody cared that much about him, right? Um. So years later, uh, my uh, an ex girlfriend and I, who uh, was a partner of mine in my tour business, now we are regarded as the most haunted bar in the entire country. So uh, you can find us on Netflix and Discovery and A and E and Travel Channel, Sci Fi Channel, History Channel. Anyway, we have five primary tours: the original Ghost Tour, a Tour 2.0, the Cream City Cannibal Tour, Milwaukee Courts is known as the Cream City. The Horning Twenties Tour, because Milwaukee was known as the best entertainment city in the entire country. People came here from everywhere to participate in our brothels. And we had we had blocks and blocks and blocks of brothels right around City Hall. Coincidentally, we had a mayor named David Rose who uh, really kept them in business. I'm sure he got a little of this play. Literally, you could stumble out the back door and you're in a brothel. And they were very elaborate from 1885 on, where you had these little Viennese quartets that were playing in all marble foyers and whatever else is taking place. But as you went down the block, you are now in like the, the horse stalls, where people are having sex with horses or dogs or something else, whatever whatever depravity would take place, or a uh, brothel with only midgets working, or you know whatever, whatever. We had it all. Ooh, Milwaukee, right? So we were bigger than Chicago at one point as a city too. So. Huge industrial base, um, huge amount of industry and, and manufacturing and all sorts of things that took place here, which was a follow-up to the early days of the French explorers where you've had all the fur traders like Marquette and everybody else in South who were here. So uh, Milwaukee and Wisconsin had a huge history in the country, especially if you look at us as being more the east coast of the country at that time, because again, we're in the 1890s, we're not that far away from the new world, right? So fast forward to um, maybe 2009, 2010, uh, my girlfriend Amanda and I are in Key West and um, every place that we go that day, people ask where you're from and we say Milwaukee and they'd say, oh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Now we're there to do research for ghost tours, right? But and I say to her at some point that day, uh, when we get back home, we're going to do a Dahmer tour. And we are we are known in the industry as being very meticulous about our research on things. Um, and we are more uh, docents and historians than we are tour guides. We're not like the New Orleans, drink some more, drink some more, drink some more. We're not, you can drink here, of course, we're a bar, but that's not what our push is. The push is that there are actual things that take place which is why we have the number of film companies that we have. Netflix will be back this July. And then if they sign the contract, the Ghost Hunters are back in September. So, you know, they come and they come back because they get the material. They're looking for without this contrived Zach Baggins kind of a thing like that, right? So anyway, we're down there, we get that, and uh, we come back and we get to work doing the research on this. Now, because you've had all of our contacts with the detectives that were part of the caper, uh, the DA's office. This is before the internet, right? So we had access to all sorts of things, the reports, the pictures, all that before it was disseminated everywhere else. And that helped us to put together the story. Uh, you referenced at one point, um, uh, Pat Kennedy was the lead detective on that. He He's passed a few years ago as well. So we're getting further and further away from those real experiences. But in one of the videos that we did on my YouTube channel, uh, Shaker's Milwaukee channel, we have three different portions. And on one of those, we had a guy come in last year from Cedar Rapids. Now, this guy came to take our Dahmer tour, but he bore a um, resemblance to Jeffrey Dahmer, which was not unintentional. He cut his hair, changed his style, did whatever else to make himself look very similar to that. We did three pieces with him, and at one point, uh, he's talking about how he has dreams about how he is killing people and how he's eating people. And I think one fine day, you'll be reading about him doing much the same thing. Well, he's obsessed with it, whatever you want to call it. He is, he really thinks that he is the second coming of Dahmer. So uh, we had one of the detectives who is retired now, of course, but he's the guy that booked Dahmer the day they brought him in. And he tells a story about how when he uh, he printed him, whatever else, he had no idea what he'd done. 
So they didn't, they didn't at that time talk about that portion. He's there. He does the prints. He does the pictures. He does whatever. We'll get you a shirt when you leave. And that's the picture that he had taken as well for this. So um, I brought Phil. I brought uh, Phil back in to talk to Laura Brand. So we had Laura Brand visiting maybe a month ago. And she's a forensic psychologist. And she and I have been communicating for a couple of years now. And as a psychologist, she has developed a new test pattern, 50 questions, that um, really identify those people that are merely sociopathic into those that have a predilection or tendency towards becoming a serial killer. So she's out doing a lecture circuit. There was something Green Bay that she appeared for. And then she spent a couple of days here. Um, I brought in a, a former uh, state DOJ, uh, in fact, the old head of the uh, Lieutenant of Homicide uh, Unit, um, uh, a Milwaukee detective that uh, worked on this, the scene, and uh, another Milwaukee detective that worked on the serial rape case, and then a federal agent as well. So we did like a fireside chat kind of a thing, lasted about an hour and a half, a bit more. And she talked about her experiences when she spent five years in San Quentin um, interviewing a number of different serial killers. But Dahmer is something that always had piqued her interest, which is why we were talking about what we're talking about. But from that experience, just talking to Laura, we are now in partner together, partnership together in Los Angeles. And I was there last week uh, marking off the tour for the Toolbox Killers. So 1979, um, two guys, Bitterker and Norris, um, had gotten together, you know, educated from their other time in the uh, in the system. And um, bright guy, I think uh, Bitterker's like 146 IQ, which is not an uncommon thing, by the way. There's a theme that goes on, so brighter than average. And um, they got themselves the first rape van, and they would just grab women off the street, girls, women, uh assault them, rape them, use their toolbox to dismantle them, torture them, pull out their teeth, pull out their parts. Very graphic. Laura is much more graphic than I, than I am. Um, and of course, rape them and then to completely dismember the bodies. But one of their calling cards was an ice pick through the ears. And they determined that just an ice pick in one ear wasn't enough. They had to do both ears and they had to turn them around as well. So, it's interesting that you're working on a DA because the district attorney's office doesn't have enough money to exhume additional bodies. They tried them for five cases. The guys are on death row. They've now succumbed. Um, but in her talks with them, Laura was able to establish that there were other bodies as well. And they had cold cases. And she was able to befriend them enough that they gave up the location of two of the bodies so she's out there in the Hollywood Hills with a metal detector, and only because the ear, the ice picks on the ear, she was able to determine where those bodies are. She's also located a body farm with 10 to 12 additional bodies that can be attributed to them, but the LA County doesn't have the money to exhume them now. So we're not gonna do anything with those sites. We're staying far away from that, obviously. Um, but I'd have to imagine that there's even much more of that everywhere in the country and the world because there are a lot of people that are really off the rails. So the, the tour that you set up on Dahmer for here, I mean, we're talking 32 years now, I haven't heard of um, it. It's still remaining so popular. Much more so than ever. Um, in fact, when Netflix filmed this for Dark Tourist, which I think was in 2017, they did really a hatchet job, no pun intended. Um, but they had brought in a, a production team out of New Zealand that was fantastic, but they brought in a host from England who was just a pompous jerk. So every place that he went to, where one I think seven or eight locations in the US, he was just a complete jerk to everybody. And he was here too. So for example, on our tour, which is about a mile long, and it covers those places both the north and south of us that he would hunt at. This was his hunt area. So at that time, it was like gay bars on both sides of us. We were the sole non-gay place that was here and the sole restaurant as well. So um, 
you know, again, I, I can well see some days like today that are less than favorable and you're walking around outside and you want to stop and get warm for a moment or get a drink or something else. So that kind of made sense to me. The rest of his association with being here, I think, was only because you've got all these high ranking judges and prosecutors and attorneys that are here. And he just wanted to be like, I'm the biggest badass and nobody knows who I am kind of a thing. So I'm invisible by being here with you. So, so Bob, um, during that time, I, I'm, I'm geographically a little challenged here because I walked to his home. I'm staying at the hotel downtown at Hilton, but I walked to his home and walked the neighborhood. Um, people today that live in that neighborhood, many didn't even know who Jeffrey Dahmer was. Well, we filmed with this guy uh, again last year from Cedar Rapids, and we took him over there to where the Oxford apartment used to be. The city had demolished that. And while we were there, there is a uh, there's a man, African American, who drove past us four or five times. And then he stopped. It was a summer day anyway. He got on and said, "You got you guys here for Jeffrey?" He said, "I can tell you a story about that. We cover that, by the way, in, in our channel, YouTube channel." But he talks about how um, his kids used to play in this apartment complex next door to Dahmer. And he said that they stopped coming one day because the stench was so bad. Every time they came, it smelled worse and worse and worse. So there's a lot of things that took place here that really fell through the cracks. So you can go back to his recent exposure situations. You can go back to his fondling of, of little boys that he was able to get out on. Um, whole lot of things that that otherwise should have been a warning sign along the way um you could talk about how society perhaps was at that time how they treated things maybe differently than they should have but um certainly he was given impunity in many ways to commit these atrocities and he got more emboldened every time um even the things like so he's got these 55 gallon drums that he he goes to pick up at wherever the manufacturing or distribution center was, and he takes them home on the bus. In my mind, that doesn't happen every day, right? Um, or even when he picked up the uh, the large suitcase kind of a thing, and he had it. You know, he's clearly on a guy who's traveling around the world with something, and that should have sparked someone's interest. Um, but he kept getting by and by and by, time and again, with things. Um, and certainly, of course, uh, Cynthia Sapone, you know, running naked down the street hole in his head, bleeding from his head and his butt, and uh, the two women stop and call it in, and it's like, oh, no, it's a, just a boyfriend, it's all taken care of, don't worry about a thing. Where does that remotely make sense? I mean, nowhere is the answer, right? Yeah, and I mean, you, you talk about one of those places where law enforcement could do nothing more than say, we screwed up, we didn't, we didn't do it right. Um, and it ended up costing, I think, just one more person before he was captured. But well, that's not factual because, like, the young woman that we interviewed there, I think that's only her second interview. Uh, Stone Phillips was her first, and I think I was her second that she talked to. So this is, at that time, 30 years or just shy of 30 years. Um, and she is incredibly affected. She is. She lost her business. She lost her relationship. Uh, she was shunned. It, it was the damage on her, I mean, there, there's, there's collateral damage everywhere in this case. And um, to that degree, it's fortunate that only 17 people actually were murdered by him, if, if that's the real number. And I say that because there, you know, there have been long things about things in Florida, yes or no, perhaps, or the time he spent in the army in Germany, uh, where people disappeared the same MO kind of a thing. My thought on that is that Germany had a death penalty. Right, Florida had a death penalty. Wisconsin didn't. So why, why? I mean, you can confess your sins and be away the rest of your life, and then find God again here in Wisconsin. It wouldn't happen that way in Germany. Yeah. Well, and and one of the things that we've seen in looking at these kinds of predators is that what may start out as a very organized mindset over time starts to become disorganized, especially as the snowball starts to build. And toward the end, I mean, this was a voracious appetite that he was trying to satisfy. Well, I'd use the uh, the term or lexicon appetite because he certainly developed that as well. It's probably a poor choice, choice of words when you consider what happened. So, But you said something really important, Bob, that I want to explore a little bit, and that was 
the collateral victimization that occurs in a case like this. So let's go back to the, you've opened up the bar, you're filled with federal and local agents, and all of a sudden the reality of this kid that gave you a, a pretty seasoned guy who's probably seen almost everything in this bar, a shutter down his spine, all of a sudden you're thinking, and hearing this kid has 17 bodies in his apartment. Um, tell me about that for you personally, for the community, what what the talk about town was. So the, uh, the BBC was here filming a year or two ago, and that was the entire impetus of their story, was the damage to the city, or other cities as well, where something heinous like this had taken place. And there is a significant shift in the property values, um, for several years, uh, whether it was NPR or somebody else would be here filming outside uh, or other documentary companies, and they'd film not just our place but everything up and down the strip because after Dahmer, it, it was dead here. Um, and even look at Ambrosia Chocolate, which has been around for 100 some odd years, a very prominent international player based in Milwaukee. And that's because of no fault except for the fact that they had hired Jeffrey Dahmer to work there in their warehouse. Um, they couldn't survive anymore. So they were acquired by another firm, and then it was expedient for the city to acquire them. Eminent domain, perhaps, is what they used for that, and to get them out of there. That's not where the, the Fiserv uh, Forum is. That's where the Bucks play. That's that area right there. But that used to be Ambrosia Chocolate. So you'd come to Milwaukee, and there's, there's two primary smells you'd get. One was this chocolate wafting through the air, it's almost like you're in Belgium. It was it was a marvelous thing. And then you'd get this the smell of the, all the yeast that they use, the breweries. So I guess on a bad day, you'd get the alewives in Lake Michigan as well. But you really have these really good food smells first and foremost. That's gone, right? So that's part of the damage that went with that. All those jobs of those people that as Ambrosia was moved out of Milwaukee um, and they were acquired by someone else, they moved to the far northwest side to Menominee Falls. But they moved in such a way that the people that worked in the warehouse or worked at the facility didn't have transportation to get there. So that really exacerbates much of the, the big city um, societal move that takes place when something catastrophic happens. People can't get the jobs because that job is gone now, right? So that has its own snowball effect upon those families. Um, and then there's just this, this whole thing, like us going to Key West and people say, oh, Milwaukee. Because in the past, they'd say, oh, brewing capital of the world or whatever they'd say about Milwaukee, right? Summerfest, the world's biggest music festival. Now the focus is all about Jeffrey Dahmer. So that's just in the psyche. That's everyone's collective psyche that bad things have happened here. So you could say bad things happen in a lot of places, but they certainly did happen here. And because it wasn't just, it wasn't just that he picked up um, stray men that were that were outcasts from society but uh and he killed them of course but he dismembered them he had sex with their bodies uh well before and after they're dead and uh then he uh cut the parts apart and some he saved ritualistically and some he cooked right so you you get all sorts of things that it isn't just a guy that's killed 17 people it's a guy that's done the absolute most despicable things that you can do to a human body. He did. And that has left a bigger mark on things and more shame. Certainly the, uh, the damage with the three coppers. And you can say, yeah, they were negligent or, you know, malfeasance or something as far as how they handled that caper. Um, I know those cops. And uh, no matter what you might hear, they are all affected by what they did or didn't do that night. And um, that has affected their personal relationships and everything that anybody who's involved with them. That certainly defect, you know, rather uh, impacted the Milwaukee Police Department as well. And uh, the DA's saw everything was, was impacted by that and not necessarily for the good. Right? So, Bob, thank you. Um, I've come to know you a little bit better just in the last uh, day as we chatted a little bit, but tonight especially. But tell, tell me how it impacted you personally. And, and then I want you to add why you tell the Jeffrey Starmer story today. Because you know what? I don't believe you do it to sell a tour. 
let me start with that. We we definitely don't. And because um, we do do what is regarded as a high level tour, uh, it is important to me to put a the best representation on the city of Milwaukee as you possibly can. We can't make any part of this look sunny. That's never going to happen. And, and it shouldn't happen. But there are significant lessons to learn from this. Don't leave your drink unattended. Don't uh, accept drinks from strangers. Uh, don't offer to go home for 50 bucks to have someone take pictures of you. Uh, all sorts of don'ts, don'ts, don'ts. And you think about, we have a we have a significant clientele that's anywhere from say 24 years old to 55 years old, but you've got all these young women. They don't know that lesson. They, they, even today, they don't grasp what took place. You can say, well, it's 30 years ago. It doesn't matter when it is. It's, it's a valid lesson at all times that all people should be responsible for and to learn. And another thing about that is that you think about, there were all these gay bars. In my mind, there's no reason for those gay bars to exist today because society has changed and um, moved in such a way that, that I don't think people really care what your preference or proclivity is or anything else. There's not, in my mind, just like the, the Pride Parade or Pride Festival, it's become, at one point it was a social movement, now I think it's just a party, right? And I don't think that there's, I don't think that there is the need for them to have a place that they could go and party and be safe or something else. I think they can be perfectly in the community. And being in the normal community, I think, gives them security that they wouldn't have by just being isolated and being stuck in one place. So maybe that's a good thing that came out of this. Um, but it's important to us that we do a real credible tour and we don't glorify anything that he did. We try to have as much respect as possible when we have people on the tour and talk about the victims, talk about what the experts would say as far as the rationalization for how he became this way, signs to look out for. Um, you know, the, the kid obviously was, was a loner. Uh, he had a very difficult time positioning at school. Uh, his parents had a very toxic relationship with each other. Um, if you watch uh, Stone Phillips' interview and you see his father stroking his arm all the time, I'm not a psychologist, but that says to me there's something else deeply seated that's there that someone somewhere should have been aware of when he was a kid. Um, Certainly his uh, interactions in grade school were very bad. Um, and again, you should have had somebody in a school, but you know, look at schools today, how much can they do? They don't, they don't teach anymore anyway. It's, it's, maybe it's more social work today, but they certainly should have had more social work interaction with him when he was young. I don't know if you could have, you could have um, nullified this or not, but maybe you could have made some impact on that. I don't know. But certainly this is a guy who needed help, right? Shouldn't have been on the streets. And that could have been identified time and time and time again. If <clears throat> I like to think that it made an impact that the judicial system would have said, we must change the way we look at this and how we handle these cases. I know for a fact that didn't happen, right? You know it too, right? It's the slap the hand, put them on the wheel and spin them out down the conveyor belt. And um, we, we don't take the time to work with our societal ills and woes, which only creates a bigger issue for them. Um, so how did it impact you personally? Well, again, um, it impacted my restaurant, and we were an incredibly high-end restaurant and known as that. So when now you've got people that don't want to come here because the association with this area, with Jeffrey Dahmer, I mean, that had a real bottom-line impact on our businesses. There's no question about that. And I had uh, developed a line of products back in 1989 that, excuse me, We were discovered by Marshall Fields, which is based in Chicago at that time, um, high-end department store. And they had dinner here, and they asked me to create a product that they would sell. So a few months later, we're now in the in the food manufacturing business, in addition to the restaurant, the bar, whatever else. And then I think we're picked up by Beaumarchais in, in Washington State, then to Macy's, to Bloomingdale's, whatever. But I would be doing food shows, whether it's on the West Coast or I'm doing food shows at some point like Neiman Marcus or something. And uh, oh, where are you from? Oh, Milwaukee. Oh, Jeffrey Dahmer. So even years later, it still has that kind of a push going on with it. Shakers is and always has been from day one a marketing firm that happens to sell 
food and beverage tour cigars as the only cigar bar, whatever else, and whatever else that we're into. And we are really effective at marketing things. It is a challenge to market in a food in an environment where people make the association with Dahmer and cannibals. And you know, even the, the, I don't want to say frequency because it wasn't frequency that he was here, but even with his intermittent visits over the course of six or seven months, that's what people stick with. So that had a huge impact on not just my business as Shakers, but for Babalu's Foods as well, which then had an impact, of course, on my relationship with my wife, ex-wife. I mean, all these things, there's interaction with everything. So there's always collateral damage. And it's not just black and white. It, it, it radiates out, right? You know, it's so interesting that you would say that because for police officers, we oftentimes think that they're bulletproof and these cases never go away. Um, you live a case, it impacts you emotionally, it impacts your relationships. And, and we forget this collateral damage of victimization. One thing you taught me today, though, that I didn't really think about is the collateral damage from a fiscal standpoint for a city, for an entire block that's whole uh, character changed because of Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, it's this was a very vibrant commercial. Well, it still is a very, it is again, rather, a very vibrant commercial district. But if you think where his apartment complex was, the Oxford apartment complex, so the city tore that down. So those people are are displaced, right? I mean, they're they're no longer there, and that affects not just the people that live there. It thinks yeah, that impacts the kids and the schools that they went to. That that affects everything, right? It's not just one sided, and then the amount of industry that then moved out of that area as well. It it um, it, it doesn't stop. It's a cancer. It just continues to grow and to grow, and the damage grows right along with it. So. So, uh, I, uh, n number one, thank you so much. I assume I have permission to use this in a video <laughs> since I didn't ask any of that in the beginning. Uh, you know, um, my apologies here because, yes, you do, of course. I should have got the, uh, the my task came out to at least record this. So, if you don't mind sharing this with me, we'll post this on our site as well. I would love to. And, and of course, we want to encourage everyone to come over to Shaker's YouTube channel, subscribe, and uh, make sure that you're doing that. But you also have... Uh, when you talked about merchandising, I thought you got to have some stuff that people can pick up online or other things, don't you? What are the, we do. What are the options for people to, to get some uh, memorabilia from? So the, uh, the division that we have for tours, both here in Savannah and in L.A., is Hangman Tours. And you can go to the Hangman Tours. We have different styles of uh, Dahmer shirts. One has the, uh, you know, the picture of Dahmer that was taken as booking we also have different artists that work in the community, uh, some who work here, who have done different series of Dahmer shirts as well. As I'm getting further into this, and, and really there was a long period of time that I didn't, I, I do a lot of interviews, I do a lot of podcasts, um, I'm in several different books or things, and of course the documentaries that are filmed here, and I really for a while just wanted to distance myself because that's that's not what I'm into. I'm not, you know, I, I one time went to one of these, um, uh, conventions, right? And it was primarily to sell our, our ghost regalia and whatever else we do there. We got the brand that's seen everywhere. But um, it really occurred to me that a lot of people that are into this are kind of freaky themselves. And I, in my mind, they're in, they're an RCH away from falling off that rail and, and doing something. If there was an opportunity, they could be the next one. And um, I I don't want to be part of that world. Um, and yet, here we are, we're, we're now doing this thing with uh, with Laura Brand, with the Toolbox Killers, then we have other serial killers in California, there's no shortage there. And um, yeah, we're gonna make we're gonna make some money on this, but above and beyond that, I think that, I like to think that what we're doing is we are bringing public awareness to something that needs to be brought forward. So if you think about even like the Boston Strangler, um, I think that there's some good lessons there as well. And, and you go, you, let's go to London for God's sakes, the Whitechapel murders, right? So, you know, these young women should not be out on the street walking around by themselves. There's something very toxic about our relationship with ourselves. And that's never going to go away. A reason that we shouldn't go into space. We, you know, it's bad enough that we contaminate things here, but we can't get along well with ourselves and not just you and I as two guys sitting here, but with women sitting here as well, it, 
it, you know, there's something primal that's there that some people can't control themselves. And you can't just enjoy life. You've got to be aware all the time. So this week I actually posted a video called the Victim Risk Continuum. Okay. And uh, I hope you'll go over and look at that. I'll send you the link. But basically I talked about the fact that while we're not victim blaming, victims do hold some responsibility in what happens to them. You see it every night in a bar. And I talk a lot about the difference in victims. We have low risk victims that might be like a housewife who doesn't go out on the weekend. She plays the piano at the school on Thursdays. And, and uh, when she's victimized, statistically, she's going to be victimized by somebody that's known to her. And she's a target. You know, that's that mom that disappears. But on the flip side, someone who's considered a high-risk person, it might be someone involved in narcotic trafficking or a sex trade worker or something like that. This high-risk individual, when they're victimized, are usually a victim of opportunity and they don't know who that person is. Now, the person may know who they are because they've been watching them in the bar, slipping them a pill or sure. something else. And um, at first, I was... Uh, a little concerned that people would take this wrong when I talked about this responsibility, but the only thing that can change that is circumstance, situations, and environment. So that that mom who never goes anywhere could become high risk if she had to leave home at two o'clock in the morning to visit a sick parent and her car breaks down. She had to go to Walgreens to get uh, medication for her kids, something like that, right? Exactly. Yeah. So um, as a as an owner of an establishment that provides drinks, provides an atmosphere where people can come together and meet, what kind of responsibility do you feel to kind of watch? You talked about earlier, don't walk away from your drink. But I suspect it's something you probably teach your bartenders and others to watch and see if somebody's taking it home. Well, that's, again, one of the advantages of having a primarily female staff is that part of that is ingrained to them from the little or at least should be. So it's, it's easier in our protocol meetings to have them, if they don't already know, then they should, to just perk it up a bit more and be more receptive to that type of activity. I'd like to say that at Shakers, we've got a, a, a better educated and a better class of people, but the reality is a bar is a bar and the city is a city and things happen anywhere, right? It, it doesn't matter where you are or you know what, what the ba basic makeup of people is going to be, it doesn't change, people are toxic and corrupt and uh, give an opportunity to find a way to exercise some some other demons that restrain them from doing something the good demons they'll play with the bad demons go do something else so we try to make people aware all the time we talk about this on a regular basis we have our own safety protocols for staff and of course very importantly for customers because nobody wants bad PR right you want your customers to be able to come back right so um, that that begins with make sure they don't you know uh, consume too much alcohol to begin with. You can't have that happen to them. Um, so we, we kind of have to be not nursemaids, but we're like that school marm that's kind of watching over things a little bit. Yet at the same time, we are also here to help the entertainment move along so people can enjoy their experience while they're here and want to come back for that reason too. You know, like anything else in life, it's a fine line, but we do make our staff very much aware of it. And I think it, it doesn't hurt that we are a copper bar and a fed bar because they interact with with your um, background and your people all the time, right? So, I mean, that's 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 only a really good thing. And I, I can never understand, and I've been in this business for a long time, 40-some years, I've owned these silly things, why people don't like to go to cop bars, don't like to have that around them, because to me, if you got a place where a law enforcement officer can feel safe and secure and not have to worry about his back all the time because he's comfortable in that surrounding and the people that are with him are as well, that should make you more comfortable to be there too. So. Well, folks, I've been talking to Bob Weiss, owner of Shaker's Cigar Bar here in Milwaukee. you got to make a trip here and check this place out. And while you're here, if you email ahead and hit the uh, email address and the link to the, to the uh, bar, is going to be down below, and uh, Bob will respond to you probably personally. But uh, set up a tour. Make sure you take the tour. Make sure you uh, take care of this establishment. And, and Bob, I, I'm just—I got to say, what am I eating for dinner tonight? Because 
I'm looking forward to whatever. I'm thinking fish shrimp to start you off. Otherwise, I've got some beautiful Copper River salmon that just flew in from Alaska. We could do that as well. So. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, <laughs> from, from all of us at Profile and Evil, I want to say thanks. I'm going to send you a book that I just recently wrote. It was happening at that same time that Dahmer was yep. arrested. And, uh, and it'll be my gift to you. But thank you so much. Bob. My pleasure. Again, thank you for the opportunity. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you um, got the hookup. Cheers. Well, I hope you found the video to be informative. Please take a moment and visit Bob Weiss's bar online. And if you're in Milwaukee, make sure that you pay Bob a visit. Take the ghost tour. And after you've taken the ghost tour, make sure you get the Jeffrey Dahmer tour. Now, please hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell so that you get all of our notifications. And if you're interested in channel memberships, consider joining the Academy level. It's my favorite. It's a place where you'll get all kinds of additional information. Your financial support helps us to continue to roll out quality content, and it's deeply appreciated. And then make sure you're watching for my video with Annie Schwartz the first reporter on scene at the Dahmer crime scenes. Her insight into this case is unmatched. You know, she's the author of one of the best-selling books on Jeffrey Dahmer, a place that you're going to learn so much more. So the links are going to be down below. Thanks for your support of Profiling Evil. And we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.